think we'll get started. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, the panel is uh, a higher ed radical reboot. I am joined by Naveen Megahed, Michael Sorrell, Paul Vallis, and John Katzman. I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes framing the conversation, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to these folks who are in their own ways thinking about rebooting higher education. Uh, so we spent a little bit of time on, on the phone thinking about what we might do today. And, um, and, and we sort of landed on uh, a need to uh, transform or significantly evolve um, higher education at scale in the national interest. And I'm just going to spend a minute unpacking each of those terms to frame the discussion. So when we talk about transformation, what are we talking about? So we think of um, sustainably enabling higher education providers to affordably enable all students to acquire a credential that enables them to serve their communities and survive and contribute to the new economy. All right, sustainably, because higher education providers need to sustain themselves in order for all this to work. All students, because it means ensuring that all students, not just the white affluent students that have so been well, so well served by our higher education systems in the past, uh, uh, in a, uh, and, and, and um, preparing themselves to contribute to their community and the new economy. Uh, so tra that's the transformation part. At scale, uh, the labor economist suggests that colleges and universities are on track to produce 11 million fewer credentialed individuals than the national workforce requires in 2025. 11 million fewer credentialed individuals than the workforce requires in 2025. So that represents about a six, maybe 7% compound annual growth rate in credentialing productivity, right? That means that every university and college across the country has to improve its credentialing productivity by six or 7% every year, year on year till 2025. How many people actually know a university that's doing that? Right? There's four, I mean, if you just do the Title IV, there's 4,700. This is a national, this is a, uh, this is an epic, a problem of epic proportion. So that's the scale part. I can think of a few universities, but less than a dozen. Um, and then finally, in the national interest, this is not just about workforce development. This is about equity. This is about addressing the attainment gaps and, and, and the growing inequality in this country. Look, higher education, uh, some form of credential, post-secondary credential, is probably the most reliable pathway into the middle class today. And the opportunity to acquire one affordably is, is distributed in gross disproportion. A, a affluent white person is five times more likely than a low-income person, five times more likely to acquire some form of post-secondary credential by age 24. And those numbers are just as bad if you look at them by race ethnicity. Right? So it's not just about educating more students and creating more credentials. It's about educating students who have been historically have been underserved by colleges and universities today. So that's what we mean when we talk about transformation at scale in the national interest. So we're going to just go down the line. Each one of these um, folks who have joined me up here are involved in implementing very evolved models or thinking about them. Uh, they're going to spend five minutes each uh, talking about uh, their work, just in general, some of the, the, the key highlights. And then we'll have some general discussion around issues of um, uh, that, that cross uh, each, of, uh, each of their work. So I'm going to begin with uh, Naveen, and there's a, sort of a logic we're starting with. Uh, Naveen and Michael, who are working in institutional contexts within colleges uh, in very radically different ways, um, and then Paul and John, who are really painting on a, on a larger canvas, I think that's fair to say. So uh, Naveen, over Thank to you. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Uh, so I, I am the sitting president at National Lewis University. It is a uh, urban university in the city of Chicago, over 130 years old, and uh, and it's always been an institution that's been dedicated to access. But I'd say that uh, you know about six, seven years ago, uh, woke up one morning and said, uh, "Boy, that this public narrative is getting pretty loud," and and. And it's pretty serious, and we need to do something about it. And uh, so as an institution, we took a big risk and said that we were going to uh, totally re-engineer our undergraduate education uh, and come up with something that was affordable, scalable, uh, and designed to address the needs, particularly of underserved students. And uh, 
And as we, uh, as we launched it, we also had to come, become very clear that this was our way of embodying the mission of the institution in the 21st century. And it was also a way of clearly articulating that we believe that our purpose as an institution was to drive economic and social mobility. So uh, uh, we went to work and said that we were going to create a degree that was no more than $10,000 a year for students and that everything we did had to optimize around that price point because we knew the first and most important uh, obstacle was gonna be uh, the price for students. We picked that price point because within Illinois, if you are a student who is underserved and is what we call zero EFC, that you can't afford any family support, that between Pell and MAP grants, your education would be fully paid. So essentially, you'd have no cost to get your bachelor's degree. Uh, and the journey has been an amazing journey as we've been, learned to, to build this and scale it. We started out with 80 students our first year. We're now at over 1,000 students in three years once we launched, uh, looking to bring in our biggest class, which will probably be six to 700 students in this coming fall, six to 700. But what we did is we assembled a program that was uh, leveraged adaptive learning, so we knew we needed to use technology to drive scale. Uh, we flipped the classroom so that students did all of their, basically their books and their, uh, their studies online, but then came to class for applying all the learning. We gave every student a coach, uh, a success coach that worked with them holistically. We developed a set of predictive analytics to know when to intervene. And we started building an infrastructure that would help us to, to, uh, to take this to whatever level it needed to go to. Now what's interesting is, that in, you know, we talk about this great need for people to have a post-secondary credential, but this is coupled now with a narrative where fewer and fewer people are uh, feeling the need necessarily to go to college, and there's a narrative that says, do you actually need college, which I happen to disagree with, that some post-secondary credential is critical for your future. Uh, and a lot of the institutions within our region are probably declining in enrollment, while ours is soaring in enrollment because we're serving the new demographic that needs to have an education. Uh, so what we serve is a student who has a 2.0 average or above. Most institutions won't look at you if you're not at least a 2.5. Uh, we serve those, uh, we do not require an ACT or SAT score because we don't see them as predictive for those students. And we work very hard to understand the, the process of um, what it takes for them to be successful. Now I'm going to tell you what our, our findings have been. I'm looking at this, I should finish. Our findings have been that anyone can succeed if they put the effort in. So I was just at Angela Duckworth's presentation on, on grit and persistence, and it rings true. If we can get our students to do the work, they will succeed. And what's interesting is through an adaptive learning platform, we actually can see if they're doing the work. In fact, I, I had the opportunity to meet Bill Gates, and he asked what was the most uh, impressive thing we had learned about technology, and I said, this is going to sound really stupid, but the most impressive thing is that we can see if the student's actually doing the work. And for the first time, they can't say, but I'm doing all this work, but, they're, but they don't even realize they're not actually putting the effort in. So we can actually intervene on the level of helping people understand how to self-manage and make the effort. So the biggest predictors of their success, are they doing the work? And the second biggest predictor is, do they show up for class? So interestingly, it's driven a lot of our interventions with them. That said, our goal is to perfect this model, scale it, scale it both through our own abilities as well as getting other institutions to adopt it and scale it. And our, and our goal is to ensure our students are employed at the end, and we have a very strong career platform that we build through there. Uh, and the work is pretty amazing, and the students we serve are absolutely amazing in the potential that they represent when they come through that door and they're ready to make a difference in their lives and the lives of their families and the communities in which they reside. I'll leave it at that and let others go. Thank you so much. Yeah. Michael. Good morning. <clears throat> um, so I am president of a school that a decade ago was one of the worst institutions in America. And I don't say that to be glib or funny. The data proved it out. Uh, I inherited an institution that had a 1% graduation rate. Wow. Uh, and I just want to point out, do you have any idea how committed you have to be to produce a 1% graduation <laughs> rate? Um, the retention rate was 33%. The students were unhappy. The community was unhappy. Everything was broken. And I was told that we had a year to a year and a half 
before the institution would be forced to go out of business. Um, and so when you are in a situation where you are unencumbered by a history of success, it is very liberating, <laughs> right? Um, so we blew everything up, okay? And we asked ourselves if we were going to design an institution for this era to address the problems of today, what would that look like? And we started out by challenging this idea of what are colleges and universities supposed to do? We think that they're supposed to turn themselves outward and address the needs of the day, right? You don't just do things. I mean, let me, let me back up and say it this way. I think it's great that there are top 20 institutions. I benefited personally from them because I went to them, right? Did a wonderful job. But the reality of it is the majority of the students in the marketplace today don't go to those institutions. So why, for God's sake, would we think that those are the institutions that we should trust in educating students that they would never let into their schools? Like, that, that doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. I know the rest of you went to those schools, so you're upset. <laughs> I got it, right? But the reality of it is you know I'm right. I am fascinated by schools with 6 7 and 8% Pell Grant students wanting to tell me what to do with an 85% Pell Grant population, <laughs> right? 70% of our students have zero expected family contributions. Unless you are buying bus tickets home and plane tickets and things like that, you can't understand, right? Revolutions don't start from above, they start from below. They start from people who are upset, who are dissatisfied and disillusioned. So we actually listened to our students. We asked them, what is it that you need to make your lives better? Then we went out and polled the marketplace and said, what do you need students to be able to do? And then we got lucky, right? We stumbled on a work high school model by Crystal Ray Network. And some of you might be familiar with Crystal Ray. It's work high schools. And I remember sitting in Detroit with the president of Detroit Crystal Ray and asked him, why wouldn't this model work in higher ed? And he said, well, it does. They're the work colleges. I said, the work colleges are rural colleges, right? Why wouldn't this work in an urban setting? And he said, well, no one's tried it, which was music to our ears. <laughs> so we created a brand new form of higher education. We created the urban work college model. And this is what it means. It means that students work between 10 to 15 hours a week. They work in jobs that we find them, either on campus or off campus. The economic model demands that students really go to work off campus because the companies that they go to work for wind up paying for their services, right? Now, we price it low to move so that companies really can't use an excuse it's too expensive. The students leave with a work transcript and an academic transcript. They then know to show you how they can think and how they can do things, right? The other thing that's interesting about this is it changes the way students see themselves, right? They are part of our institution. They're part of our workforce. Uh, it, it is working out beautifully, okay? We are sitting here right now about to expand the program nationally. When I, in my first two years of being a college president, we lost 80, 85% of the student body, okay? <laughs> Typically, you get fired in those moments, right? <laughs> uh, but it helps that you have a job that no one else wants, right? So, <laughs> uh, but we knew that it was going to be a struggle getting things turned around and changing. And here's what the work college format does. One, it changes your donor base. Two, it changes the student's engagement level. You're exactly right. If they will do the work, they can succeed. The problem is students that come from under-resourced communities, there's so much baggage with them that oftentimes they don't do the work. Right? They don't do the work because they're not interested in the work. They don't do the work because they don't know how to do the work. Because the ones who get to college, they're in college actually because people just passed them along because they were the good kids. They didn't cause too many problems. And in a system where you have too many students in a classroom, why wouldn't you do that, right? I mean, not that it's right, but you're just trying to survive because the level of dysfunctionality that exists now, poverty is ruining our country. And unless we decide to deal with it, it's never gonna get better. So we have decided as an institution, our number one goal is to end poverty. We're gonna use, because everyone talks about education as a way out of poverty, no, 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 no. Money is the way out of poverty, right? <laughs> so we believe in getting students jobs getting them jobs that change their lives, change their career trajectory, and changes their family career or family 
uh, economic experience. So I'm happy to talk more about it, but what I will tell you is our enrollment has shot up through the roof. Uh, so has our fundraising. Um, and literally, we're at the point now where we're going to expand the program nationally. We're going to create a network of urban work colleges. We're also working with a, another group of schools to create a consortium of schools who convert to this model. Uh, and we've got something else we call reality-based education, where we're actually using the classroom to teach students to solve the problems for their lives. But I've used my five minutes, so you'll just have to stick around. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Incidentally, uh, um, Crystal Ray opened their first school in Chicago. In Chicago. And I remember I, I asked uh, Father Foley, I, uh, the plan was we were going to perhaps give them a charter, and I got a lecture from the Cardinal in religious immersion, so uh, that uh, went by the wayside. Uh, but uh, it's an extraordinary model, and I, I, I think what you're doing at the university level, college level, is extraordinary, too. Uh, you know, I'm a strategic planner, and what I want to do is talk um, very quickly about kind of the superintendent's uh, perspective on this, having been a superintendent in four large urban districts. And, and the, uh, I've always felt that, the, the way th that uh, it's critically important for universities to establish linkage with their feeder high schools. And they can play a very constructive role in not only, uh, uh, obviously from their vantage point, recruiting students, but preparing students so that they can improve their retention rates by the type of relationships they establish. And I just want to talk about one, for example. Uh, you know, the senior year is an extraordinarily wasteful year in high schools. Particularly if you reach the senior year, you're taking a lot of irrelevant courses, you're just doing fillers. Uh, what we decided to do at, in my last superintendentship was to establish a relationship with each of the community, with each of the universities in, the, in Connecticut, Bridgeport University, Sacred Heart, and, um, and uh, Fairfield University, three prominent universities who wanted to diversify their student population, wanted to recruit more minorities and poor from the inner city. So we decided to restructure our senior year. We decided to give all the students the AccuPlacer exam in their, at the end of their junior year to determine uh, where those students were academically. If they passed the AccuPlacer exam, they were immediately admitted to those three universities and they were able to take courses for dual credit. So they literally spent a good part of their senior year, about half their senior year, taking courses, earning college credit, being on a college credit track. All of a sudden, all the high schools now became college preparatory institutions, so it changed the whole mentality in high schools. If you fail the AccuPlacer, and incidentally, uh, if you also pass the AccuPlacer, but you elected not to enroll in the college courses, we immediately enrolled you into work-study courses with uh, work-study programs with neighborhood businesses, et cetera, occupational technical training, et cetera, using that senior year, those senior year monies to, in effect, pay, uh, pay for those degrees. So it literally cost us nothing. Now, if you failed the AccuPlacer, then those universities worked with us the senior year to get those very same students in the type of prep programs that 73% of the graduates who are college-bound had to take anyway, that being the historical pattern uh, in, the, uh, in, the, um, in, in the Bridgeport School District. So what we were, in effect, able to do was to change the dynamic for us, for a, a school district, we were able to uh, um, transform all of our schools into college preparatory institutions, create this mentality that college was indeed the possibility. Indeed, you could be enrolled in college before you've even graduated, but then also wait, not waste that senior year, rather concentrating those senior year resources on those students who were struggling, preparing them for college, preparing them for uh, universities post, you know, post their post high school education experience. What the universities got is they, in effect, expanded their pipeline of inner city students and what they received were students that were prepared, students that, had a, that were more likely to, uh, to graduate instead of 10% uh, graduation rates, 60, 70, 80% graduation rates because those students were well prepared because they had already adapted to that environment. So those were the type of feeder patterns that we had talked about. Now we also talked about taking it one step further uh, I was re recently working to try to revitalize the university in, in, in the inner city, looking at this very specific model. But we also talked about also creating um, uh, a, a mechanism by which each of the co respective colleges 
would adopt individual high schools and provide programs specific to those colleges, like the technology a college focusing on things like coding and things like that, and going beyond just providing the, the, the dual enrollment or the early college, but also getting students enrolled in summer camps and actually providing online tutoring services to those very same students. So what you were doing is you were dipping into the high schools as early as their junior year, identifying students, uh, recruiting students, incentivizing students to continue to, to, to uh, consider your, your institution of higher learning and then, all, and then in effect prepping them and preparing them to ensure that if they were admitted uh, they had the capability of, uh, of, of being successful. So that's just one example of a way that in a very cost-effective way that you can establish mutually beneficial relationships with feeder schools and in effect not only help boost your enrollment numbers but also more importantly boost your retention numbers. Great. Thank you. Well, like each of you guys, I don't, I don't think any of us are trying to transform the system. We're trying to transform one or a number of schools and then let them compete, uh, raise their capacity, uh, lower their costs, and, uh, and then hopefully that cascades, and if not, um, they'll just get larger. <laughs> uh, uh, Noodle Partners is, uh, is a next generation online program manager, or uh, OPM. Um, when I started to you a decade ago, it cost $15 million to build a program, and, uh, and it was pretty high risk. You didn't know, would it be any good, and would anybody take it? Um, at this point, building a really good online program costs two to three million dollars, and 30 percent of the people getting their graduate degrees are getting them online, so there's a lot lower risk. Um, so there's real opportunity to, uh, uh, well, furthermore, there's been 20 billion dollars invested in EdTech. There are an awful lot of good things to build on. Um, the way we've uh, constructed Noodle is uh, modeled after Boeing or Tesla, right? <laughs> Boeing makes wings and everything else, they, they spec it and source it and assemble it. Uh, Tesla makes batteries and almost everything else is from one of about 200 uh, uh, key vendors. Um, we make middleware uh, to tie everything together and, uh, and some analytic tools. We bring in some expertise, but we have 50 subcontractors who we bring in uh, to assemble uh, our, our, our programs, and as a result, um, we can build really good online programs, which is sort of the first step in what we're doing, uh, for between fifteen and $30,000 less per student than a traditional OPM of the same quality. <coughs> so um, it, it's, a, it's a, a pretty big uh, uh, cost savings for the school and, and ultimately for the students, uh, we believe. Um, at this point, we're working with a dozen great universities, public and private. Uh, we just announced uh, Boston College today, but there, there are a bunch of others, um, and uh, about 24 degree programs. And my stretch goal is by the end of the year, we'll be at uh, 100 degree programs, uh, undergraduate and, uh, and graduate. Um, our, our two models, we work on a fee base, um, but we also have raised $200 million in debt capacity when a school wants us to fund the program, uh, they pay a revenue share that's temporary. Uh, we borrow the money as we build out the program. We pay it back as the program scales up and we're taking a revenue share. And then when we've paid it back, then it goes to just a fee base uh, uh, again. Um, so our, our goals are, are to create, in general, a, a, a measure of transparency in our programs a measure of agility, right? We're at this funny moment right now. You're watching the retail space, Amazon Go um, on the one side, uh, Walmart's acquisition of Jet on the other side. The lines between online and, um, and retail have pretty much disappeared, and the line between online learning and classroom learning are going to disappear as well in the next couple of years. You just have a program, and people are taking different courses and different modalities. Um, we're trying to steer towards that, and, uh, um, and we're also trying to steer towards networks. Um, if, if you think about it, 75% of the people getting online degrees are getting them within 100 miles of home, um, not because they root for the football team, but because they're buying into a job network. And they might be rooting for the football team, too. Um, <laughs> but, but that means that the great majority of universities are not competitors to our schools. 
And if the school isn't your competitor, potentially it's your ally. Um, how do we help our schools work with each other in clever ways to lower costs and raise the quality of what they do? Um, if you look at every sector in the economy, tech has lowered the cost, right? It has disrupted things by making them a lot less expensive. Bizarrely, in, in education, technology has raised the cost. If you look at um, the net price paid by students, you know, freshmen in college pay 50% of stated tuition, upperclassmen pay about 65%, graduate students on campus pay about 75%, and students in online programs run by OPMs pay about 95% of stated tuition. We are, we are actually raising the cost of higher ed. Um, I believe we can collectively dramatically lower the cost of higher ed, uh, not just from there to where their campus programs are, but beyond that, without screwing anything up. And do I have one more minute? Oh, no. yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, I, did a pro I, I, I did an analysis. I was trying to figure out if we're going to try to save schools money, where are they spending the money? And so we did a project called the College Cost Project, um, and it's up online. Um, still in kind of late beta, um, but we've taken it uh, uh, out from behind the wall. It's um, on a single residential undergraduate basis. What's a one-page P&L for every university in the country? So where do they get their money and where do they spend it for a single student? And you know the numbers are all over the place, but there are a couple constants. And the biggest one is that faculty teaching is about 20% of what they're spending, right? The teaching faculty. Um, research generally pays for itself with research grants, plus or minus, um, but the teaching part is 20% and is relatively flat over the past decade. The things that are going through the roof, the things that are uh, the low-hanging fruit for the tech sector are academic support and counseling, which is tripled, and the physical plant. You can't do much to lower the cost of the physical plant, but you can dramatically raise the number of students going through that physical plant, which accomplishes the same thing. Um, so, so if we work together, we can cure cost disease, and, uh, and, and, and everything we're doing is sort of aimed around that. That's great, thank you. A um, Couple of common themes that I wanted to, to tease out. Um, one of them has to do with the kind of obstacles that you've faced and how you've overcome. So just be curious, you know, if you look back on your experience um, in these areas, uh, obviously, John, if you want to go back over a couple of uh, companies, the one or two obstacles to realizing the vision and then how you've actually moved against them uh, successfully. In what, Michael, you look like you have oh, an answer. Well, no, I'm just trying to. So, I was going to I was going to mix it up a little bit so we, otherwise we'd get you know we'd, we'd sort of um, get a simulative effect here. So our obstacles frankly was we just we didn't have a history of success um, and we were proposing things that were radical that people had no reason to believe, right? I mean, so people don't tend to expect innovation to come from places they haven't heard of. Right, I mean, that, that's just the way it is. I mean, and our innovation is not tech innovation, right? Our innovation is every man innovation, right? We tell people all the time, we're not the Harvard or MIT of innovation, we're the Walmart of innovation, right? So we focus in the places where the majority of people happen to be. The majority of people are leading lives that are economically fragile, right? So we listened to them, we designed systems that empowered them. We thought, you know, maybe we should cut tuition and fees. So we cut them by $10,000, right? We thought that maybe students would like a classroom experience that actually spoke to their interests. So we create team-based projects where you actually talk about and try and address and solve the issues from your, your own lives. Um, I mean, frankly, we, we dealt with the naysayers by ignoring them. Right, but just we just kept going. We believed in the model, um, and we just believed that, you know, we live in a country where we found some data on this that's incredible. Billionaires last year made so much money that they could have ended extreme poverty seven times over, and yet it still exists. So we decided to listen to the people who are suffering the most and try and address their needs and worry about the adulation later. John, you look. 
Scott. I, the biggest obstacle for most of us is execution. You know, we, there are plenty of good ideas and there are plenty of good schools with really interesting approaches and, and the delta in the end is the team you have and, and, and can you just deliver you know, a, a predictable, scalable, efficient results. And you're, you guys are here, the ideas were good, but it's also just relentless execution. Yeah. I agree. You know, it, it, I teach a course for the uh, General Finance uh, Officers Association, and they have about 1,800 superintendents now, school districts that are members. And the, the course is how to transform budgets into school improvement uh, vehicles. And, you know, there's a real disconnect when it comes to dealing with finances and, and dealing programmatically. Because there's this tendency to try to stabilize the patient and then go in and actually do the serious work when, you know, budgets themselves can be vehicles for education transformation, programmatic transformation. So the approach that, I, that I've always used with the four large districts that I've taken responsibility for, all of whom were on the, on the precipice of bankruptcy, uh, Chicago in 95, uh, Philadelphia in 2001, New Orleans after Katrina, uh, Bridgeport that was going broke, was always to, to in effect, identify what, what the essential things, the essential practices existed in all high-performing schools and then to build my budgets around supporting those essential practices. Because as, as John pointed out, the, uh, you know, the percentage of money that was, you know, do you realize that, that, that um, we discovered that you could standardize your curriculum, provide all the teachers with superior curriculum and structural models, modernize the classrooms, modernize the school buildings, and, and, and if you did subscriptions and leases as opposed to going out and purchasing all these things, and if you had a strategic plan and did strategic sourcing, you could actually uh, uh, completely transform the classrooms and sustain that transformation because the technology flips every three years for less than 2% of your budget. For less than 2% of your budget, just imagine if you lockbox 5% of your budget, every single classroom would become like a lifeboat. In a, in a storm of budgetary uncertainty. So I think that's, that's a fundamental problem. Uh, you know, I can certainly regale you as to the trials and tribulations of having to deal with uh, state university institutions as, a law, as, a, as in contrast to, to, to private not-for-profit institutions where there's less, le much less uh, opposition or much less resistance, maybe because their survival is based on their ability to continue to draw students, but that the, f the disconnect between developing long-term financial plans that, that are there to support a long-term strategic plan, I, I think is, is legend. That's what I've discovered in every single school district that I've been tasked with, uh, with uh, serving as CEO of, or for that matter, school districts that I've consulted for. And I would say that um, our biggest obstacle was the entropy of the academy. Uh, you know, we were saying we were going to turn education on its head. And uh, you can see our faculty like, oh, please do. Please turn education on its head. Uh, and it's, what we had to do is we actually incubated this whole thing separately. And we said that this was under the purview of the president and the provost. And, uh, Thankfully, the first few years, everyone thought, oh, this is their pet project. Nothing's going to come of it, <laughs> right? And so they kind of gave you the latitude to do whatever you need to do. We were changing the governance system, the mm -hmm. load system, the, mm -hmm. the expectations of the faculty, the expectations of looking at analytics. All of those things were completely brand new and very culturally different, a lot of accountability. And uh, well, we had to over and over again keep that whole entity protected. And then as it grew successful, then, then it became like a big infection in the system. And you started to see the system trying to destroy a, any mm. kind of innovation. And a lot of times when you're in a regular system, you, you start, it's, it's almost like it's seen as this foreign body and how do we get rid of this thing that's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so then we had to develop a lot more creativity around how to get people to own it and be part of it with us as we were building this. And it, and it continues today as just really creating the kind of culture that shifts what happens in higher ed. You have to understand that when you're in a traditional system, people, well, why are you doing all that for the students? They should be taking care of themselves. They should be doing these kinds of things. We're like, 
um, because we want to support them to be successful because our measure of success is their measure of success because we view ourselves as being a student ready university not is the ready is the student not ready for the university that we have to be ready for the student so people had a hard time arguing those points but living those points became harder if you were not part of the emergent approach we've made huge progress around that but but i'll tell you that is that's probably why we don't see more innovation across higher ed in general, is that the systems are so entrenched that really creating systemic change takes a lot of perseverance, a lot of courage, a lot of constantly overcoming the resistance. And then the third point is, um, we like to say, oh, it's the faculty who are resistant. It's not the faculty only. It's everybody. It's about change management. When you're changing and saying, we have got to change. We have got to do what we are meant to do, which is serve these students well and help them to achieve their potential. You get that resistance from leadership, that they don't understand what that means. You get that resistance from support staff. It really takes a lot of work and communication and constant, almost like constituency building, to get that change to really sort of set in for people. That's great. So there's a bunch of issues and not a bunch of time. So I'm going to ask a <laughs> complex question. Um, it, it is going to go a little bit off the reservation, but bear with me. And I know that you're all gracious enough uh, to. So, so there's a couple of things. I want to talk about scaling. You know, and we, you've each mentioned it in your own way, uh, the, the work that you're doing, the thoughts you're bringing to bear on higher education. I want to just elaborate a little about uh, how you're thinking about scaling. But in, in doing that, I want you to work in two. Here's the off the reservation, but two, two bits. Each of you, in your own way, have referred to market mechanisms acting in higher education. Uh, 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 John and Michael and Paul directly, when you referenced you know, organizations at or beyond a fiscal cliff, you know, John supporting institutions so they could compete in the marketplace. So in advance of th your thinking about scale, I'd just be curious, do you, do you think that every institution should, should be supported through its survival? Or do, and if you do not, do you see opportunities for graceful market exit? And I mean graceful insofar as students are not denied the opportunity that they would have otherwise had. So just to, to frame your thinking about scale, is this a salvage operation across the whole industry, or is it a much more market-based approach? Um, and then finally, work into your comments about um, scale, just some, to, the, to your point about leadership. I mean, each of you, in your own way, are extraordinary leaders. Um, uh, and, and you have extraordinary teams, and have built extraordinary teams. Um, do, you ha do you see, do you have the optimism that that leadership capability, and I'm leaving you to define it, is replicable at the depth and breadth that will be needed in order to achieve the kind of scale that you envisage. So scale with respect of your views of the market, market exit, and something about leadership capability. Um, who wants to take that one first? I'll take one part of it. <laughs> well, I knew that wasn't going to work. No, I, the biggest problem in education we all deal with is, is how bad the data is. Um, and, and when we talk about things like outcomes uh, in higher ed, we're closer to having a beat on it than we are in K-12, but we're still wandering around. Um, the, the notion that the same metrics are true of a philosophy program at Harvard and at you know, a, a, a general assembly computer science course, you know, there obviously uh, each institution has to figure out what it's there to do and measure it rigorously on a data segmented basis so that you can see for you as a student what, what might be the, the best course of action. And we're a long way away from that. The, the biggest impediment to scale in education is that lack of transparency. Bad things persist, good things have trouble scaling because it's hard to differentiate if you're a, if you're a student. Um, to me, uh, the, the notion, for instance, that you have two programs in a, in a, in a, in a geographic area, um, both of equal prestige, one of them is net price about $30,000, $40,000 less, 100% of students, if they knew those facts, would go the same way, but they don't. And the whole point of marketing efforts is to keep them from knowing it. Um, so, so how do we create a better ecosystem? How do we create more transparency? Um, and that speaks to obstacles as well. That's super. Yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. 
So, uh, so I think that um, with, uh, first let me speak to exit. I think that what is happening in our sector is it's just starting to accelerate and it's not going to go away. And I think we're going to see a lot of consolidation in our sector and or institutions will go away. They're either going to find their, their graceful way to exit, which is probably by consolidation with another institution, or they're not going to survive. I had a futurist speak to us oh, was about eight years ago and who was all about disruption. And he, he talked about that typically when you start seeing these disruptive forces at work, what, end, what the end result is, you see institutions that scale. And he said scale is a million students or more. Or you see students, or, or you see institutions that are niche players. And niche players are 50,000 or more. And at the time, I was like, oh my god, which direction do we go in? And so we decided to sort of tack and, and sort of hedge our bets a little in both directions. But I believe that's exactly what's going to end up happening in the higher ed sector, especially as it, technology advances. When I look at last year, when I was looking at what edX had done, and they had finally found a way to create the kind of interactivity and engagement of students that led to the outcomes they wanted to see in learning without a faculty's engagement. I was like, this is it, that we are, that, you know, it cost them several million to get there. But once they engineer that price down, which, which will happen, learning is going to completely change and it's, there will only be a few winners and losers. So you're talking about leadership and, you know, do I see our future surviving or not? I honestly have to say, I don't know. I, I, I feel like what I do every year is I come to this conference to see what, what the trends are and how to position our institution to make sure that we're staying on top of those trends so that we have the best opportunity to be either one of those scaled or niche players. But whether we've done it in time and whether we're resourced enough to get there, time will tell. And whether we have the grit and the persistence, we certainly have that. But time will still tell whether we have the other things to get us there. I don't know if I got you guys. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. I think the market's going to drive institutions out. There are too many institutions who just don't have the capacity to evolve. And with the technological revolution, and it's only going to, it's, it's like, it's not what do we want from technology, it's what does technology want from us. It's almost, it's like the seventh <laughs> stage of evolution when you really think about it. It's now, it's now leading us along. So, and the, the institutions are just simply not going to survive. Uh, uh, and uh, because they're not adaptable. Again, going back to the, the whole budgeting or doing long-term financial planning uh, uh, with an eye towards supporting you know, your long-term education strategy, one of the things that I always talk about uh, 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 in, that, uh, in that course is the importance of having institutional flexibility. Your institution needs to become organic. It needs to be designed so that it can constantly evolve. You know, I say this, and, and I'll just use this as an example, because sure, somebody would say, well, you know, the Defense Department, it's, uh, you know, they've got a virtually unlimited budget, so why are you using the, them a, as an example? But, you know, the War College and the Command and General Staff College, from which all military doctrine and training and tactics emerges from, is not just a group of professors who have been there for 20 or 30 years. Uh, uh, all military doctrine emerges from those two institutions, and those two institutions are staffed by officers who have completed their command. And once they've completed their command, they go to the War College and the Command General Staff College to, in fact, download what they've learned and what they've experienced. So what happens is you know, the, the doctrine, the tactics, the strategies are constantly evolving because they've created this organic structure. You know, When you look at school districts these days, they've got administrators who are like two, three, four, five, ten years removed from the classroom. Once you've been removed from the classroom for two years, you, uh, the classroom is an alien place to you. Hell, it's an alien place to most of the students. So, so I think the key is to, to, to create a, an infrastructure that's organic and that can evolve. Um, I will say one thing, leadership is critically important. You know, I'm from a state where you've got universities that have plumbing and enrollment, and then you have universities that are, are thriving. You have a, like one example of a state university that has continued to, to move along and, and, and to really grow is Governor's State, a classic, uh, of course, National Lewis is a model for a not-for-profit private university that's growing, while well, these other state universities and many of the private universities, uh, some of your competitors, have plummeting enrollments. Why is that? Leadership is important. Sure, you have this culture that you have to overcome, 
But I've been in too many situations where sometimes a strong leader is supported by a core group of individuals. Once they've articulated a vision, once they've showed people what the future looks like in great clarity, you can bring people along. So leadership is critical. Can I? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let, let, me, let me say this. Um, this isn't an academic exercise, <laughs> right? These are people's lives, OK? Yesterday, I sat on a panel where someone said that because of artificial intelligence, in five years, 40 million people could be displaced from their jobs, OK? 40 million people. Service industry employment, the people who are on the fringes are the most economically vulnerable. If that turns out to be true, that will then add to the 45 million Americans who are already in poverty. We live in a country that, for reasons which we could debate ad nauseum, has begun to turn its back on those individuals. And the pursuit of endless innovation without addressing the underlying issues of what do we do with the people who have been displaced by this, right? So when we talk about scale, who are we talking about scale for? <laughs> we think scale has to be addressed in a way that allows people who are the most fragile, the most at risk of disenfranchisement, of being left behind with a pathway to success. But see, that's messy because you've got to deal with everything that goes on in their lives. The students don't just show up in class with iPads ready to learn, okay? They come to us broken because society and poverty has broken them. That's where the opportunities for scale exist. So as we talk about making institutions more efficient, how do you make institutions more efficient when people's lives are less efficient? where you can no longer just ask people to show up and learn. And we don't have that conversation. We don't deal with that in a way that allows us to scale with the people who most need us to scale. That is the scaling that we are committed to. That is the fight that we are fighting. And it absolutely takes leadership, right? But it takes leadership that is unafraid of failing. Okay, it takes leadership that doesn't fall in love with the accolades or being like, look, if you are afraid of losing your job, you can't lead in the way that this space demands because you have to take risks and you might fail. And that's okay if you're advancing the ball. Now, I don't want to lose my job. I have young children. I've got lots of tuition to pay for, right? <laughs> but my point is I don't lead from a place of fear, right? I lead from a place of actually loving the people that we are trying to fix the problems for and involve them in that process. That's the scaling that needs to occur.